So, my name is Brian Richardson. We're going to start out with a presentation saying I'm not a security person, but I'm trying. That will become more obvious as we go through the presentation. I work on firmware. I've worked on firmware for the past 21 years, not the same piece of firmware. Um, I have moved through firmware development, testing, uh, Skunkworks kind of projects into what they call technical marketing, which is explaining things to people in English instead of in technobabble. This presentation is kind of a blend of those two things. I want to basically bring firmware to everybody's attention. Uh, because if you pay attention to stuff like uh, Black Hat, which is a very hot place, but the beer isn't quite as good, and they scare you pretty much three or four days um, when you should be in a casino, and say so you go up and go, please don't be my product, please don't be my product. Oh, it's my product. Oh. I got to do a keynote at a Vegas conference last year. None of my products came up in anybody else's presentation. Uh, I want to talk about firmware, which most people in here commonly know as BIOS, because it's kind of important. It's the first code on your platform, uh, motherboard, use the term motherboard, that gets control of the systems. When you boot and you see the cool little spinning wheel or the logo of the company you bought the laptop from, or you're waiting for your graphics card to come up, turn on your monitors, and boot the system at home, that's firmware doing that. Uh, and because it gets control of reset and persistent on the motherboard, it's also responsible for making sure all the hardware in your platform is working. If you have the kind of thing like a, a real desktop system that all people have to build, um, it initializes all the adding parts, checks the size of memory. Did you go to Best Buy and buy more memory? Nope. Okay, same memory as last time. Go with the same settings. Now, because of this, and by the way, all that usually lives on a little chip. Right here. Uh, that's an 8 megabyte SPI serial uh, home interface. Your peripheral interface. Um, those, that's where all that lives. So a tiny board you can find your chip. And that could be 4 to 16 megabytes of code. Uh, anybody in here recently written a program under 16 megabytes? Probably not. Okay. Um, okay. Boring, right? We should all know that when you turn the motherboard on, there's something on the motherboard that makes it go. If you go to Black Hat, um, you're finding places to drop things into this code because it's persistent code that lives on the motherboard. If I get one of those nasty, supposedly Russian um, crypto virusy things that encrypts my hard drive and asks me for Bitcoin, I'm going to politely use a hand gesture. Um, yeah, I'll just tell them they're number four in binary. We're number four. We're number four. Some of the programmers all laughed. Um, <laughs> everybody used the bit mask and see laughed. Everybody else went like, yeah. Um, so once that happens, I'm going to go to one of my mini backups. I'm the kind of guy that keeps hard drives in a, you know, like in a, in a lockbox in a bank, like a really cheap JSON form. It's like 25 bucks in there, a passport for one country with my real name on it, and a bunch of hard drives. <laughs> <laughs> really lame. But now that it's persistent code on the motherboard, if somebody gets it into that firmware, I can't format that out. I have a brick system. That's basically going into the junker, or for me, I can probably pull an SPI program around and do something with it. Okay, so this has now become the new place where people want to do hip things and hide stuff. That makes your job as security professionals a lot harder. It makes my job as a firmware guy a lot harder because I have to learn the stuff that you're learning because I write anti C and assembly. That's my programming background. Right? Great stuff. So, what I want to talk about is why firmware is critical, so that you know why you should care for the next 48 minutes and change, why it's a popular target for attackers, the kinds of things that can be done in a firmware attack, what are your threats, what's your, what's your exposure, and then why does Super Mario Brothers prepare the world models when you get a child? Okay, we're not going to cover a couple of things. This is not a specific attack session. I don't have the same problem the Army guy does about not being able to disclose and say stuff I can read with police, but it's not really quick. Um, it's a philosophical argument. Um, but I'm not doing an attack as how to, right? If you want to learn that stuff next summer in Vegas, knock yourself out. It's a little expensive for server hotel rooms now. I'm not going to tell you how to develop firmware because even after 21 years, I'm still kind of figuring that out. Um, I will provide links to people who want to start looking at it. There are ways responsibly to do this using open source tools. And I'm not going to talk about non-Intel attack scenarios. I work for Intel. Um, aside from the Super Mario stuff, I'm representing my employer. They probably have different feelings about some of the names I'm going to put in here. Whatever. 
But the point is, is that I'm not going to speak ill of competition. I'm not going to go out and say, these people put this attack and it was terrible, but they get designed code. Now, I'm not going to do that. I know those people, we work on spec groups, they buy me beers and things. Okay, again, you have to go to a very strange place to understand this. You have to go into the mind of firmware programmer, which is a very weird place to be. If a firmware developer does their job correctly, nobody knows they exist. Our guy who has technical marketing in his job title this may have been a poor choice, but I've been gainfully employed for 21 years. So it's not ruined that. Let's take a typical firmware guy. Um, right? Sorry. I'm the only one who signed the release. Um, and look inside their brain, which is again a really weird place. And I understand how I think about firmware to understand why I choose to work on it for decades, continuing and hopefully a third one, because my house ain't paid for. And first of all, welcome to Ashton, North Carolina. I grew up in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Uh, last two years of high school, I went to the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics in Durham, North Carolina. Any uniform in my house? Oh, uh, our mascot is the unicorn. That's right. You got all the nerds, 500 of them, into a school, and then you pick a mythical creature from a D&D campaign to be their mascot. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> now help it. Now, one thing you notice coming to Asheville is bridges. This little thing on the Blue Ridge Parkway, how many car commercials have you seen as a North Carolinian and gone, they shot that BMW commercial at Blue Ridge Parkway? Let's fly over helicopter shots, now it's a drone shot. By the way, Georgia thanks North Carolina for all of their film business. The cast of Sleepy Hollow says hello. Um, we will happily give the tax breaks and take all your money out of Wilmington. Bridges are really important to you. Uh, I spend a lot of time in Portland, where Intel has its largest concentration of employees. They love their bridges. We have bridges in Atlanta too. We had one a couple of months ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this went about as well as you would have expected. <laughs> Atlanta is an interesting kind of thing. So we have three interstates, one east-west, two north-south, which temporarily combine in the middle. Why do they combine in the middle? Because the DOT doesn't do redundancy very well, and somebody thought if I have two interstates in the same place, that's twice the federal funding on the same type of payment. That means there's a choke point right below one of the largest state highways, Georgia 400, it's called the uh, off road Audubon. Um, yeah, that happened. I was in China, I was in Shanghai the day before I flew back. I'm just going to go back to Atlanta traffic. It's so much more relaxing than it is in Shanghai. There's 26 million people. Yes, exactly. And Atlanta said, hold my sweet tea. <laughs> and somehow I was on Twitter from China, don't ask. And I saw this pop up, and I'm like, maybe I'll just stay in this taxi cab. This here. We fixed this in record time because we threw millions of dollars as a bonus to the contractor to fix this ahead of schedule. It is the nicest less than a mile of pavement in all of Atlanta. There's not a steel plate to be found. <laughs> so I think of firmware like infrastructure because it is the thing that, at the bottom of the software stack, the lowest part of the software stack you have, sitting right there over your little, well, let's say you microcode, it's the lowest part of the software stack. Now, because I travel internationally a lot and do conferences, here, if you walk up to a water fountain, it's not really a fall. It's a water fountain. Free water. I will drink from the water fountain. Now, if I move, say, to Michigan, <laughs> I'm going to think before I push the button on the water fountain. I'm going to look up and see the name on the water tower and then go, right, I should probably go down the street and get a fresco. Um, and then you end up, you wrote an assembly code. This is the image in your head when you're done, right? You're reading somebody's uncommented git to bit of like a Perl script. This is kind of what you have in your head, and this is the way a lot of people have done firmware. It's just this low-level thing, I'll get to the cool OS code later, let me just make this work. You know, this is just like duct tape and bailing coin. And firmware was looked at this, especially in embedded devices. Things on the internet, there's a lot of this stuff going on under the hood. Because it's just, it's just you boo I've been here for like 300 instructions and then I'm done. Why does it have to be well architected? So a lot of firmware people are learning that I need to think like a better plumber, right? Has anybody done their own home plumbing? Like from the start, not fix the thing that they came in afterwards? Okay, I've done both. And the reason I did some of the plumbing from the start is because in the trailer that my wife and I bought, I'm sorry, the modular home, the property that we bought, it was done with like, you know, 
blind apprentice plumbing sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, and it's all like, you know, whatever it came before tracks, that 1970s stuff that you torque down a little metal band over plastic and run hot water through, because that's going to work really well. <laughs> now, there are lawsuits. We didn't qualify for them. So I redid a lot of the plumbing in my house. And then when we built our barn, I did all that myself from scratch. Learned a couple of things. You know, you pressure test. You open all the taps before you turn the water on first to make sure everything flows. And then you slowly close the taps one by one and check all the pressure. When you hit the last one, you're going to find out real fast if you glue down all the joints or not. <laughs> Spoiler alert, I didn't. You hit in the face with my own plumbing. And then had to run to the street because we hadn't put in the shutoff yet. <laughs> and you would think, I mean, we're all nerds. We, we have a plumber as a role model. Mario and Luigi. Now, first of all, why are they the Super Mario Brothers? It's Mario and Luigi. Is it Mario, Mario, and Luigi, Mario? Is Luigi the nickname like we named the dog Indiana? Anyway, do not look to them for plumbing. They are all. Do they ever fix a pipe in the games? They destroy pipes. They, like, there's just a sea of bricks, gold coins, and just like dead turtles. And this is their legacy. And what do we think of? Well, it's a plumber. He doesn't do any plumbing. He breaks infrastructure. He's, they're, they're these guys. And for any youngsters out in the world, just don't go Google that. <laughs> for anybody who's of the right age to remember that, it's available on Rift Tracks. So again, firmware is this kind of baseline. If I'm looking at the plumbing, if I'm going to put in the gold toilet fixture, okay, I'm, I'm not in political office. I'm going to put in like something that I get from like normal plumbing stores. I have to build it on a solid base. I have to make sure all the pipes and the foundation work. So my firmware infrastructure initializes the hardware, sets up root of trust, because again, I'm the first to code the launch. I am the trusted thing that sets up everything else on top of that. If I don't have root of trust at that point, everything built on top, no matter how securely you architect it, is vulnerable. And then I hand off to the operating system. So somewhere underneath, I've got the code that I want, and I've got the code that I don't. I hate that dog. It's coming back later. And you would think, again, as nerds, we would be better Threat model because of this dude. So I wrote an article a couple of years ago for uh, the Intel Developer Zone. I'm one of the, what they call uh, evangelists, basically means I'm, I'm an engineer and they realize I can write and talk. So I just describe software to people. And if you want to talk about threat modeling, Star Wars is a great place to go because you have RGB2. Now think of the Death Star as a firewall. And you brought in a bring your own device. Now, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, they had USB-C because you didn't have to flip the droid over to plug it in, right? The first time, I'm right there. <laughs> so what do you do? You let this bring your own device in. He can connect to the network without authentication. And he connects to unsecured assets. If they had locked the garbage chute down, Star Wars is a 44-minute movie. Where the rebels lose. <laughs> and after you've seen Rogue One, that's really depressing. But speaking of Rogue One, really, they, they haven't learned anything. <laughs> but still, throughout the entirety of the whole prequels, shut down one computer, all the droids die. You'd think they'd be better at this. Now the droids are independent. You can take this one, flash over his low level software. They sign the updates for the droids? <laughs> these guys in like a garage just flash over a military grade robot and then he just shows up at their base and reprograms another robot. Wait, come on, really? These are the, and the thing is, this is a network attack scenario. These two droids are the perfect network attack scenario. You brought in a device you thought was trusted, let it connect to your network without validating if it was the original software base. And it exploits your network. Now, let's get into the actual firmware stuff and not stop poking fun at George Lucas all over the internet for um, There are two general classes of firmware I'm going to talk about. One is what we typically know as BIOS. It's heritage is from the 1980s PCAT, PCXT architecture, i.e., the beige box that launched a million clones. Not the clones in the Clone Wars, the clone PCs that match the architecture low level of the original IBM PCXT and PCAT. And because that BIOS interface is consistent 
That's what allowed all those computers to run the same DOS. Compaq won a lawsuit about reverse engineering because they had cloned in a clean room environment the BIOS. Now, IBM didn't help their case by publishing most of the routines in the little purple book that came in the box. I had that purple book, it's great. And you still have to rely on it because there are still there's still code. You boot Windows 7, there's still code that calls 16 bit interfaces to boot. And they're using table references from 1981 to 1985, hard coded spots below one megabyte in memory. Because this is a terrible idea to continue using, uh, in 2004, we launched the UE5, uh, Unified Sensible Firmware Index. It's the same thing the BIOS does without the architectural limits and being stuck with like assuming one megabyte of memory is a great idea. Now, the second kind of firmware you get is coupled bootloader and OS. Phone, watch, things on the internet that accounts make fun of because they can be hijacked by five year olds. Firmware updates make your light bulb work. There's a light bulb, a smart light bulb, susceptible to a replay attack. How can something that has one button that has two positions be susceptible to replay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about UA5. One, it's the spec I actually understand. I wrote parts of it. If you read the USB 2 part of, of the UA5 spec, sorry, uh, that was my fault. Um, but it's a popular attack target because it is the standard. If you buy a Windows 10 laptop, it has to be UA5. Even if you get the new like Qualcomm devices that are coming out, it has to be UA5. You buy an off the shelf rack server, UA5. There may be compatibility code underneath, but this is the core stuff that runs it. Because it's based on a very large single spec, there's a big book telling everybody how the surfaces work, what are the APIs. So they're going to read it right by whole time. Now, issues can be mitigated on this. It's user configurable, it's typically designed to be a, like a walk up and use system. But you're going to find that a lot of embedded in IoT devices run you we find as a hook, they just don't advertise it. And there's a big open source base that we just work off of. Now, BIOS is a weird business. In case you under, don't understand how this um, goes, <coughs> over here, just above the other half of the audience, that's your camera guy. Uh, you typically got. Camera guy's a brain, I can't get up now. All right, so you typically turn on the system and you'll see the American Megatrends logo, worked there for 15 years. Uh, you'll see the Phoenix logo inside if you're Chinese, you'll see a logo from something called Biosaw, or you'll just see HP Dell, Asus, whatever. Typically, there's one of four major companies that provide base code for the firmware. Uh, they're taking some stuff from a BSC licensed project that my company works on along with others. So Intel, Lenaro, who's the company behind ARM open source, Apple, all contribute to the same work piano for. BSD licensed UA5 base. BSD means you can take it, revise it, not OS the code back. Um, that goes into silicon vendor code, could be binary, could be source, goes straight to the people who make it. They combine that to make a general platform. So your processor, chipset, LAN. USB widgets, whatever, that all live on the board. And then somebody comes along and customizes it, and then you get the secret sauce. Ooh. Why can an MSI board overclock in the way that an ASUS board doesn't? Why does one company have a recovery method and another company doesn't? And your motherboard goes straight to a website and update the BIOS directly connected to the internet without an OS. Secret sauce. That's why you can't take an MSI BIOS and flash it on top of an ASUS motherboard. Right, because they, the hardware is just enough. There's just enough difference, so they move GPIO to mean this one it's high instead of this one it's low, and now that's customized. And a lot of the stuff still like on your phones, right? The bootloader on your phone is super customized, so you can't just take like a Samsung loader inside of running an LG phone. Someone will make you know start small wars out Korea, but also just even it work. The architectures, even if they're the same core processor, the architecture, the board's just different enough to work, that's going to throw it off. Okay. So, now you have three main categories of risk. Now these fall into executing a piece of code ahead of the OS loader. You get root kits out of time. I got in before the firmware and handed off to the OS. So I snuck something in before it ran. I got somebody into the club before they put the bell rope up. Modify firmware contents. I snuck something into the club before they even showed up to work. Privilege escalation. I pretend I belong at the club, which is the place they call the club, would be me pretending that I belong there, unless I'm like there to fix the sound or something. 
Okay, so let's look at a software stack. Yes, we're doing a software presentation. We have that stack diagram. Hardware is down here. I'm going to break it down into basic things: I/O, memory process, graphics, network. Uh, middle platform firmware. Specifically UEFI, because I'm going to talk about some architecture concepts in UEFI. I'm not going to read you the whole UEFI architecture spec. Right? Even I fall asleep in that and I wrote this. And then on top of it, you have two upper layer pieces of software. One you're used to, and that's the OS stack. And everybody in the little OS stack with all the you know, kernel piled on top of this, piled on top of that, and the apps are up here, and the idiot user that causes all the problems is like the way up at the top. Off to the side, you have something called runtime. So firmware typically leaves a runtime image. It's a small footprint of information the operating system needs. If I close the lid on my laptop, it goes to sleep. Now, if you did that 20 years ago, you were a magician because advanced power management was awful. I wrote some of that. I'm sorry. Uh, especially going to an NBC notebook, I'm really sorry. But what it does now is that somewhere in the firmware it says, hey, operating system, you're going to need to know that this little pin is the lid on the laptop. So you can set a power policy and decide if you want that to do something or nothing. If I hit the power button, it makes this little part of the silicon light up so the operating system knows I'm going to use this to shut down or hibernate. So it's leaving descriptions. It's leaving a way to set the time so that the OS can set the time on the way out. It can leave breadcrumbs in the NVRAM of server crashes. And it's before the hard drive controller came up, but when the hard drive controller is going down, can't store that on the hard drive. The hard drive controller doesn't work. <laughs> and if it's a display error, you can't put it on the screen. Yay. So you're going to leave it in VRAM and an error lock. So those are the kind of services you leave up and running. Okay. So let's start with the OS loader. The most common attack, and this is what you're going to see in stuff like ransomware, is a bootkit or rootkit style attack. I have an OS loader, it lives on a disk partition. It used to live in a magic sector of the firmware would just hand off to the sector and go, I hope everything turns out. <laughs> you don't do that anymore. That was an MBR style attack. Those are those, like you put in a floppy drive in the lab in college and all of a sudden all your floppy drives are infected because you had this little sector thing that you didn't scan for and now everybody's got it. Yay. Um, so most of the, um, like your ransomware works by implanting one of these, encrypting the hard drive and then when you boot up, the thing that tells you where to get the bitcoins is in the boot sector or in the boot loader of the OS. So you have to watch out for where the firmware is getting its boot instructions from. Now the second thing you can do is you can go down into the hardware. Now if I, let's say that you win the Lockbit Challenge and you get a shiny new NVIDIA, uh, uh, is it like P something 160 card, right? The 1060. I have an AMD. Um, <coughs> sorry, it's not like the East West West thing. Um, my video editing software likes it even better. Uh, now, when you put that in your computer, it knows how to talk to your computer. You didn't change any of the code on the board. You just dropped it in there. You get a network card, and you drop it into a server. It instantly knows how to network boot. It presents you with a little configuration menu. How does it know how to do that? Just like the motherboard, it carries a little option line. It has code that the firmware looks for, and it dispatches that to a driver execution environment, a uh, piece of code called dispatcher that sits in the firmware. So the firmware initializes the base hardware, turns on the PCI Express root board and says, is there anything out there you need to show me? And one of the cards says, yes, or well, I am a SATA card and I will give you a place to initialize myself. And so, right, and then you can update that driver. And if you don't secure the update on that driver, someone can sneak code in and they get control during the dispatcher phase and drop that code in before you're even up and running. So that's bad. And the third thing that happens is a privilege escalation. Because again, the UEFI platform firmware is responsible for building the runtime system. Now that means it can put stuff in so that it intercepts calls that the OS would make back to its platform code. Or, everybody familiar with ring zero as a concept? On Intel platforms, there's two privilege levels behind that. Um, what a lot of people in um, Black Hat Tech presentations will call ring minus two is what we call system management mode or SMM. We snuck some code into a memory window that's only visible from a special interrupt on the processor. And operating system companies both love this and hate it. They hate it because we're sneaking out behind them, and they love it because if there's a bug in the operating system, you can go, hey, can you put the 
this fix an SMM? Bad thing. So it's used for a lot of weird things like ECC memory scrubbing and a lot of other interesting cleanup routines. And some of your servers have management code that lives in SNM. And they'll try to put secret sauce over there. So those are three different ways that firmware can get stuff snuck in underneath, behind, around, whatever. Okay, so this is probably the face you're all making right now. Right? Great, Brian. You scared the crap out of us. It's not even time to go to the bar yet. You know, that's why they normally leave me for the last of these things. You need a drink afterwards. Okay, no. Now, normally I present the firmware developers and tell them why they should not do the things. Instead, I'm going to change this a little bit and talk to you as people who are pen testing and fixing as to what can you do as far as mitigation. Is there anything simple you can do to fix a lot of these issues now? And is there something that you need to do that, you know, when you buy a new system, it's something you should be looking for. It's going to magically make this go away or make this less of a problem. So again, the features you can turn on now that, that fix a lot of this, or at least make it harder for somebody to implement this kind of hack. And when you go to buy new things, once you update the firmware when you buy it, please update the firmware when you buy it. Um, you can also test for these issues to see if any of your updates contain known problems. Okay, first, like seriously, you travel with your laptop and you don't have a boot password set? Really? Alright, uh, anybody familiar with the evil maid scenario? Show of hands? Okay. Um, first of all, I don't like missing particular job types. Everybody's important. I stay in a lot of hotels. I like the housekeeping staff a lot. They're my friends. Okay. But if you walk up with a USB key and plug it in and turn on a laptop and you don't have a boot password set, it's trivial to make it boot off of that key instead of the main um, thing, like a batch button, a particular mode. Where you, know, you flip a switch and it becomes a USB storage device. So you can plug that thing in, turn the laptop on, and you can boot to whatever image you want. Now, Bash Money, of course, also lets you do that over a virtual network currently, but you can even shut down network booting as well. And then, if you are doing a headless system like a server in Iraq, then it, you don't want to do a boot password because you don't want the server to reset and go type in your password, and you're at home on a Sunday because you're sensitive. Um, so you want to set an admin password so someone just can't walk in. If you turn off like the, the fun little Thunderbolt protection where you can plug in a Thunderbolt thing that has a PCI Express card on it with an FPGA that exploits your system, it does exist. You can change a bit in the firmware that stops that DMA attack from working. And then the attacker walks right in, goes into the same setup, and he turns the bit off and then attacks your system anyway because you need to set an admin password. This kills a lot of problems. And this is built in, like even Apple has this as a feature. They didn't for a long time, but on the newer Macs, this is available. Okay. Someday, we're all going to go shopping for new stuff, right? We have an economy, I've heard. It's good. Unemployment's kind of low. We're going to buy stuff. Something's going to be made here. It'll be great. Okay. Things you can enable on a system now that will help you. Uh, the two favorite are UEFI Secure Boot and the TPM, the rest of the platform. Okay. First of all, when I said UEFI Secure Boot, probably a couple of that I use Linux, and Linux people hate Secure Boot, but Secure Boot doesn't work with Linux, and no, that has not been the case since 2011. Linus wrote an email in 2000, early 2011, and he was right then, and we fixed it. And then everybody goes back and reads the 2011 email, puts it on Reddit, and says Secure Boot doesn't work, instead of reading the manual that comes with your Linux distribution and realize that it works. I know the guy who wrote the code, I know the buddy that works with the wrote the code, and they met with Garrett Peter Jones, one's still up the door, the other one works at Google. It works. Um, UFI Secure Boot, basically, everybody signs a bootloaders against a standard certificate authority. And then you can enroll those matching public keys into your firmware and turn on Secure Boot. And then if you have a cert from the certificate authority that matches your certificate authority that's signed the loader, yay, you win. And you're not having to log into the server to do that because you win against the same CA. It's very quick. It's really slow. It's like you can't milliseconds to the DMA. Now, it does another important thing. When Secure Boot's on, only things that are Secure Boot, whether they're option ROMs or loaders, can be loaded. That means it turns off compatibility for 16-bit only code. 
That means your customers, when secure boots on, can't run Windows 7 or Windows XP. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful side effect. But it also means they can't take an old DOS stick and go, I'm going to run some DOS utility. I've got them. No, can't do that. There is a UEFI utility shell. The CA refuses to sign the shell. Refuses. Because they know the shell can be used to run certain conventions. Now, here's the wonderful thing if you're a Linux user, especially if you're going to roll your own IoT product, you can make your own keys. That means you can sign your own custom kernel with your own, you can be your own key exchange, and you can lock out a product that doesn't have your signature. That means you can run a Linux system that locks out Windows. That's a great feeling. <laughs> it's a free software people went, oh, I didn't think about that. That's great. <laughs> Wrote a white paper, it's easy to do. All right, second is TPM. TPM is a measurement system. If you run secure boot, you're basically saying, you're good, you're good, you're good, up to the OS handoff. Now the OS can look at the TPM, which is hashing a measurement during boot process in a platform configuration register, or PCR, and then it can essentially do a look back in time. If you're like the last boot that I trusted, nothing's changed, then the PCR should be exactly the same. If I take the same route to work, and I'm methodical, then I should take about the same amount of time, I should take the same number of steps. If I was tracking somebody on a trucking company, and I saw one day that their delivery took 15 minutes extra for one of the traffic jams, I would guess something's up. That's kind of what a TPM does. Now, there's another myth in the world that, that secure boot requires a TPM, which is problematic if you export to certain countries and use an older version of TPM, because TPM from the 1.2 spec earlier has export restrictions, specifically to places like China and Russia, which have their own kind of other problems exporting electronics, but that's a different issue. Not going to solve that one. TPM 2.0 removes some of those restrictions and also doesn't rely on things like SHA-1, so it's a much better system to go with. And in the case when you use BitLocker or uh, Measure Boot or um, the Secure Boot requirements for Windows systems, they typically require Secure Boot and TPM are both activated. So if you use your full BitLocker, all of these things plus hard drive encryption are turned on. Okay, when you go shopping later on, you're going to look for a couple of things. One, you want a vendor that gives you a signed firmware update. It's pretty simple. There's a Black Hat presentation out there. I'm not going to tell you which one. Go hunt for it. They list two of the top Taiwanese vendors, the number of firmware updates they put out in a period of time, and how many of them were signed for the X number of products they support. The answer surprisingly is zero. <laughs> yeah, and these are big companies. One of them does something else bad that I'll talk about later indirectly um, that makes it even if you sign the update, you can still mess with them. Um, you want a vendor that signs their updates because you want to trust that the update's coming from the right place. The best way to use a signed update, you know, state of the art, is called Capsule. Because if you have an update, you typically run a weird little utility, like a DOS utility or a Windows utility. Windows, if you're lucky, if you're in Linux, <laughs> updating firmware from Linux, that's hilarious. So you have an OS problem. Plus, it's a utility. Now you have this other piece of code in the way. What if the firmware could update itself? If you don't trust version one of the firmware from the factory, it's a different problem I cannot solve for you. But if you trust version one, then version one should be able to update to version two, and then version two to version three. As long as the signature matches everything is good. So capsule allows me to stage it in memory, but then the firmware has to use its own update. So now you have root of trust preserving root of trust, preserving root of trust. Uh, this already works in Windows and Linux. If you own a Surface product, Surface Pro, Surface Book, uh, Surface Studio, this is how you do firmware updates. They come from Windows Update, the same way <coughs> so you get your driver updates. Uh, Dell has enabled a system with Red Hat called FWUPD, which is built into the newer kernel of Linux. And then hardware root of trust. All right, Intel makes a thing called Boot Card. It's available in newer systems. We fuse keys um, with the OEM at the back. So Intel and the OEM insert a key, and the firmware comes in three chunks, and some of the chunks are signed by, signed by Intel, some by the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. So that way, even with signed capsule, there's another check going on for the update, and each one of those has to pass a phase verification as it goes through. We actually use this on a lot of the Atom products that end up as things like gateway for high resolution tests. Okay. Um, a little shout out to the government.
in here. Uh, the uh, Commerce Department has a thing called NIST. NIST makes recommendations, not specifications, recommendations on how to do security properly. There's an entire section, 800, which is nothing but cyber security, because we're the best at the cyber, right? Okay, so 800-147 and 800-147B are bias protection guidelines uh, for standard systems and server systems. And then the draft, which just closed in comments, 800-193 is firmware resiliency. So how do you protect firmware at a basic level? And how do you make sure that firmware basically can recover? So if you have a system that gets, you have to nuke from orbit, can you make sure the firmware is trusted and the firmware can recover itself in a way so that it's safe to then recover the entire system? Remote provisioning of a rack full of servers, for instance. Now, a couple of important things. One is that 800-147 is about six years old now, but it's now an ISO specification. So instead of just being a U.S. commerce requirement, uh, it's now a, you know, a standard you can use worldwide. So this means that the bottom line is really important. Manufacturers may have to comply with this to meet certain purchasing requirements. If you are specking out a system or you have to help as a consultant uh, do a bid for a large installation, make sure they're not citing this as a purchasing requirement. If they are, you have to check with all the vendors to make sure they comply with it. If you do a government bid, you can almost guarantee that the NIST 800 requirements are going to apply to it. And that your vendor of hardware, whether it's the peripheral item card or the motherboard, has to comply to 800 or 800 so this is also a nice thing to look for just in general purchasing because most of the companies aren't going to make a government spec and a consumer spec for things anymore. They're just going to make one. So they can meet the government requirement. They should be able to meet your you know, company in your old barn house in North Carolina requirement, which is a good, good building. Okay, firmware updates. Again, make sure the right firmware updates coming along. You don't want the wrong stuff suddenly like popping up from underneath your hardware going, hi, I really need this hug. <laughs> Man, I hate to ruin a lot of my 80s. Um, so firmware update, signatures and verification, is it the right board? Uh, who, who has built a gaming system? Okay, can you keep straight which MSI motherboard or Asus motherboard you slap down in that thing? Is it the B variant, C variant, is one of the blue LED, the purple LED, or maybe it's mauve, I can't really tell sometimes. So if you get the wrong firmware version and they're not verifying the board check for you or they're not signing it properly, you could accidentally flash the wrong firmware on the system and you have a very nice shiny brick now. It doesn't even make a lot of heat because it might not even turn on the fan. Um, is it signed? So you'd ask the vendors if they signed the firmware. Are they preventing rollback? This is a really important thing in Capsule. Capsule can specify the last version of firmware you can roll back to. There's an X-Point version 5. When you upgrade to version 7, someone shouldn't be able to come along and drop version 5 back in the board. And that's a way that people have defeated this sometimes. They know there's a version of the firmware that has a problem, so they roll back to the old one. And run the exploit, even though you did the right work and updated everything in your, you know, in your enclaves. So even if capsule is not name checked in the requirements, you should still get a vendor that gives you secure updates. All right. Again, scared you a little bit. Don't worry, we're working on it. So there are three things that I work on in primarily called ecosystem. Ecosystem. When you talk about the cloud, it's this big hand motion. Ecosystems are closed hand motions, right? They're all working together. So you have a cloud ecosystem for backing up cat videos, right? <laughs> um, so one is we leverage a lot of open source. More eyes make for better code. Second, we push standards so that if I go out and buy a motherboard from company A, I don't have to get an OS that's specifically made for company A's motherboard. This still exists a lot in the embedded space. I'm trying to cut back on that. It just cuts down on vendor choice. Um, and also test tools. If I tell you there's a problem out there, I should probably also tell you how to find it and fix it. If I used to teach martial arts to kids, if I'm going to teach you how to block, I'm probably going to have to teach you to punch so that you can block out of the way. I'm not going to show you, you know, I'm not going to grab you, but I'm not going to show you how to get out of the grab. All right. So, developers. Um, fuzzing and symbolic execution. Most of your API, buffer overflow kind of stuff, you could find programmatically. 
So we spent a lot of effort when Fox was coming to Wind River years ago, they made a product called Cement, it's a platform simulator. Our friend Jacob uh, lives over in Sweden. Uh, his PhD, really sharp guy, he's great, great show presentations. He's working on this thing called Excite. It's like a simulated system. It's a it's a bid for bid match of the platform that we ship. We use it for early development, and we beat snot out of it. Just every kind of interface we can throw at it. If it wants integers, we throw on sign. If it wants strings, we throw garbage. And we try to see how we can break the APIs. And since we have full visibility of the system through simulation, it makes it easier for us to narrow down and you know, close those gaps. He wrote an article about this uh, last month on Intel's uh, developer zone. So if you're interested in, in like this kind of stuff, the link's going to be in the presentation post. All right, validation. A uh, group that used to work at McAfee that now works on my team, uh, mostly in Oregon, is uh, writing a tool called Chipset. This is a security validation tool. We go to all the same conferences everybody else goes to. We know all these people. Sometimes we're the ones presenting. I'm not in Vegas this time, obviously, but this is you know, we're not there. Um, so if there's a known exploit, um, we work with them in advance. We don't like zero days. We work typically work with people um, pre disclosure. It's like a responsible industry group should get all of the stuff deployed, and then we release the information about the issue, and immediately have a chipset test that's ready to go public. Now, if zero day does happen. We scramble, use a lot of profanity, and then put this out eventually. But most of the time, we're working with the disclosure period. And Intel does have a bug bounty that encourages people to work with responsible disclosure. Firmware is covered by the bug bounty. Um, this runs in the UEFI utility environment or at the OS level. Uh, and it's a full GPL license. And if you want to go out and buy a Windows system and say, I wonder if this is going to run Linux before I drop all my money on it, we have this thing called Love. It's a single image that you flash on a USB key, you plug it in, and it runs a bunch of Linux validation tests, including chipset. It'll, it'll show you if there's any problem with that system running Linux, and also show you any of the known security issues. Now, firmware has a variety of attack services. Um, this includes the updates, the vendor features, bad coding practices, like, I don't know, these, um, not locking SMRAM, where the system man management mode lives. You know that thing that's the window behind the operating system? When you write a routine into it, you're supposed to close the memory window off. <laughs> Some people don't. Um, the SPI part is mapped directly into memory. Um, when, a, when an Intel system reboots, since it's x86 compatible, back to the 1980s. It starts out at the same reset vector, 16 bytes below one megabyte. That's mapped into a physical address in memory. You're supposed to turn that off when you get to the end of the boot. Spoiler alert, but sometimes they don't. Uh, so we have all these tests. They typically point back to an embarrassing and interesting presentation at you know, ANSEC or DEF CON, um, but we do post that information. And all that stuff's written in Python, the training materials, and tell you how to write the scripts. Um, you want to start messing with this stuff so you can give me headaches, I mean, so that you can contribute to the launch of open source? Great! Uh, Intel does a project called Minoboard. For about 150 of your US dollars, you can buy a Intel Atom platform that has all the Gerbers and Green Commons, that has the firmware minus a couple of um, blobs that have extra licensing, and open source. So you can download a board, get the matching source code to go with the firmware, Build the firmware, flash it on the board with a standard 8 pin header to a $40 device uh, called the Spy Hook, and then go to town. Debug it over the serial port. If you have a Raspberry Pi, it's the same serial port. Um, and you can, we have people that make commercial designs based on this. They just don't bother with all of our non disclosure agreements. They buy this thing from Mauser, and then they make their own design with all the open source stuff. We're going to put out another version based on the newer silicon. Uh, yes. We'll talk about the cancellations over several beers. Um, yeah, but this is all atom based products. It's not part of the recent cancellation of the lower end products. It's not in the Jewel or Fork line. Um, so this is unaffected by that. In fact, that middle board max is now the kind of standard if you want to do a maker thing at Intel. And it's really like it's 149 bucks, but we don't subsidize those. So if you wanted to go out and build that board, you could probably build it cheaper than we're sourcing higher end components and we're doing small manufacturing runs. Um, if you went out to buy another maker board, some of those are subsidized. 
and you either can't buy the part because you're not part of the foundation, or you can't make it for the amount of money they sell it for because you don't have the subsidy from the foundation. So it's a, it's a different way of building it over the side. Um, if you find an issue, don't email us in plain text. Don't put it on the message board on developer zone. Either go to USRT, which is the industry response group, get the PGP key for the email, and send it. Or go to the secure bugzilla we have on Seattle for, and enter it as a security item, which you never email, goes into a special, locked, non-public area of bugzilla, and everybody that's in USRT can track it so that it doesn't just show up in plain text and somebody's at the key site, hey, why are we still doing that? Um, but this is important, is that we actually, like a lot of the things that you've seen, um, some nanosite stuff, sorry, just, um, and some of the uh, things that just got exposed to Black Hat on DEF CON uh, went through these processes first and got proper disclosures. So the stuff that's out at DEF CON, we already know about and have mitigations for. All right, we have, now this, I want this to work by kind of fast. We've learned many things, and there's a bunch of resources at the end of the presentation on where to get open source materials, where to get the tests. But I wanted you to walk away from this with a better understanding of firmware and what it means for your average use. So remember, firmware is the persistent software that lives on your devices. Your thermostats connected to the internet, um, the various things connected to that, laptop, server, whatever. It's got some kind of firmware. It might be standards-based. It might be three people in a garage. It might be three guys in a garage anymore. It's the 21st century. It could be anybody. Um, it's critical to security. If you don't trust the firmware, no matter what you do on top of that, no matter how many keys you roll on top of it, you might have something going on underneath it. So you need to work with a trusted vendor, and if you're designing a product, there's probably somebody in here plotting a little startup. Great! Buy some more open source stuff. Try it out. Understand the firmware and don't gloss over it. It's not just a, you know, it's a speed bump to get on the information superhighway. I don't want it to be a pocket. It's a popular attack target because you get something in there, it sticks around. There's some very uncomfortable medical analogies I can make there, but this is being recorded, so I won't. Uh, it is defendable. I didn't just come here to scare you and go, good luck, and then, you know, head for a crap brewery, right? There are ways to stop these things. They're as simple as, you know, a boot password on your laptop to prevent a lot of simple walk up attacks. So when you go to get a piece of pizza, you know, at the conference buffet, somebody just doesn't walk up with a bash bunny and move your laptop. I'm trying to, by the way, figure out how to use the bash bunny to do like nice testing, not mean testing. Like, I want to write some firmware routines for it that we can disclose the same way we can fix it. Um, and it's not a place for unskilled plumbers. I mean, really, and this is something that I have to say to a lot of firmware developers. A lot of us are electrical engineers who work on microprocessors who didn't get into the cool kids club making cloud apps. So all of our skills are kind of low-level, bare bones. We're used to flipping bits. So programming practice and firmware has not always been at the top skill level, and we're working on that. So we're doing things in C. We have people that are trying to write stuff in Rust in, in the firmware level. We have people that recommend we use to go at the firmware level instead of C. We're doing more fuzz testing. We're doing more symbolic linking. We're doing a lot of virtual late virtualization testing. We use QEMU. We'll obviously Cinex a lot. So we're trying to come up with the same level as the people that you're trying to match those to the attack. And hopefully, if we all understand what we're doing, it's going to work out a lot better. Um, I have a blog, I have a Twitter account. Um, yeah, I know, I think you are good. Just, uh, no one's scanning it? Nice job. Oh, you scan, bless your heart. You're scanning a QR code in security conference. That's great. No, it's fine. It just goes to my blog on the developer site. I also just love using bless your heart. It's one of the great southern settings. And, and y'all does solve a legitimate grammatical problem. Don't be afraid to use it. I've introduced it to my friends in Oregon. Remember, we have y'all in the firmware community and all of y'all out there in the security world. 